So we continue with the discussion of um, aggregates, how to use NMR to understand the process of self association. And here you have an example of the same protein GD what we saw earlier and here we have a assembled state, so an aggregated state here and our challenge is to identify this. Each of these molecule has a certain structure and they have assembled to form a large aggregate. Now what we should do? Well, one can do you can dissociate this into the individual monomers, break the associated state into individual monomeric states. Okay. And when you make it monomer, of course you will see a beautiful NMR spectrum because each one of them is a smaller molecule now. Okay. So and that will give you all the peaks, all the expected peaks you will get here in this protein. Now you assign all of these using the standard methods which you have discussed earlier, you assign the individual peaks. Now what you do is you start reconstituting this. So slowly change the conditions, slowly change the conditions and then monitor the HSQC spectrum as you are going through the process of association. See therefore a few of those ones are indicated here, from here you go to this, then you go to this and finally when you reach here you come back to this situation where you have only small number of peaks. Okay. Therefore in this entire process you can monitor the changes in the chemical shifts or the line widths of the individual peaks to tell you which peaks are associating, which residues are associating in the, in the, in the sequential manner. So that is the strategy, so that is how we can identify. Of course when you induce this, initially this is all unfolded now, when you dissociate it they become unfolded. But when you start the reconstitution process they will also start folding, when there is it will start folding of course there will be small chemical shift changes as well. Okay. So therefore you monitor the changes in the line weights and the chemical shifts to understand about the process of the self association. Now here is an illustration of that, so you have the GED is uh, dissociated using DMSO, the dimethyl sulfoxide. In presence of dimethyl sulfoxide the, the assembly is completely dissociated, okay. you will see all the peaks here and beautifully you can analyze all of these ones there. Okay. Now you start decreasing the DMSO concentration means these are all separate samples, you will have to prepare separate samples. Okay. So this is prepared in 100% DMSO, this is in 90% DMSO, this is 85% DMSO and so on and so forth. Okay. When you have 90% DMSO you do not see as many peaks as are seen here, the few peaks are seen and many peaks have disappeared. Okay. Now you monitor those which are the ones which are changed, come to 85% more peaks have disappeared. 80% even more have disappeared, 70% more have disappeared and in 50% almost it is like the major of the original uh, associated state. Okay. So you have stopped here, beyond that it does not help anymore because you already reached that completely associated state here. Now you analyze this, when you analyze this what you get here, this is what is shown here. This portion of the protein is the end term which is what you actually see here. This remains flexible. This remains flexible even in the associated state, this is what we saw in the previous example also and this remains associated you will see these peaks. And these ones which are color coded here, these ones are happening in this disappearing in a sequential manner, okay. step wise they actually uh, disappear as you are decreasing the DMSO concentration. Okay. This is and what are the changes that are happening in the protein with regard to the structure and with regard to the relaxation properties that is shown here. So you see here this is the secondary structural propensities measured using the delta C alpha. So with the delta C alpha this is the secondary shift what we are measuring here and here you see that only a few residues they are mostly they are down here and here it is everything in the same direction. A few of those are quite above and these are the ones where the helical propensities are there. This is indicating helical propensities, a few stretches have a helical propensity there. Now you decrease, helical propensity increases, so this area also gets a helical propensity, this gets a helical propensity, okay, these peaks have disappeared, you see this helix which was present, these peaks have disappeared here, which means they are gone into the assembly, onto the associated state. Now this one is little bit of that is remaining, so so many peaks which are present here, they have vanished here because these have gone into the associated state. You cannot monitor those peaks because these peaks are vanished. Now you further go down to further uh, another value of the DMSO, you see these many peaks have disappeared, 
all of these are gone into the associated state and this big helix is still remaining. This helix is still remaining and these ones are still the end terminal anyway is a free thing to do free thing. So, this will remain till the end. So, when you go further down these are four standard typical um, uh, points are shown here. See even from here from this helix also so many peaks have disappeared here. So, small number of segments are seen in this area some peaks are there, but many peaks have disappeared ok. And this is the result of the association process. Now, what happens with respect to the line widths and the relaxation properties? The relaxation properties are indicated here. So, 100 percent, 90 percent, 85 percent, 80, 70 and 50 percent there. So, the 50 percent again the end terminal peaks are all seen and uh, same here ok. And now as you go come down from here. So, this is the area which has um, uh, on the basis of the relaxation properties is the R2 values. R2 indicates as I said the transverse relaxation rate. So, when there is exchange going on because of the associated dissociated exchange going on and that exchange produces a line broadening and the peaks will disappear and that is what is happening. So, therefore, this step wise it indicates which peaks are disappearing, which peaks are in the, uh, in the exchange process and therefore, that indicates the place where the association is going on. So, as you come down see the C terminal this particular portion is the one which is very vulnerable and these ones are uh, interacting and then of course, you see these peaks have disappeared here. You come down to 85 percent so many peaks have disappeared because these ones have participated in the association process. Come down further so all these have gone even this has gone the C terminal has gone some residues from here also have gone. This, so, these are also gone into the association process and then of by the time you reach 70 percent you already have vanished all these peaks which are here from here to here. So, almost about 25 residues from residue number 25 till the end all the peaks have disappeared and 50 percent it is it is the same. Now, this on the smile right side it indicates where the helical propensities are there and how the line width changes are happening. See this one is the end terminal which is present here this has the uh, flexible portion. Flexible portion this is always seen, this is always seen here in the unfolded state here and then of course, it gets a little bit of a helical propensity when you come down uh, in this end terminal also and then some helical propensities are seen for these residues which are in the interior of the box. This box is actually representing the associated state ok. So, the residue numbers are given here. So, which residues are going into the associated state and form helical propensities which are remaining flexible without a structure ok. So, as you go for go down go down further and further more helices are formed and more helices are getting into the interior of the of the aggregate and they are all disappearing. Notice when I looked at the CD spectrum of the entire aggregate it was mostly helical therefore, eventually the protein goes into the helical state. So, here all of this is helical everything is gone into the interior of this aggregate ag aggregate and everything is uh, has disappeared. So, this is how the process of self oxygen happens and this was extremely difficult to do it and this was possible only because of the pulse sequences which I described to you earlier. These were the HNN and HNCN pulse sequences which uh, are able to study disordered proteins, flexible proteins and because of that one was able to identify the individual residues in all of these all of these individual steps ok. Now, let us look at what is happening from the structural point of view. So, the same thing is indicated here. Now, you look at this, this is the uh, end terminal which has certain helical propensity here. So, you go further to the next step, these helices start aggregating the transition, trans transiently they are aggregating. Then of course, the proper structure is formed, the stable structure is formed, the helix is formed and um, these helices start aggregating here ok, this can form the helical aggregate in this process ok. Now, this process one can identify analyze it a little bit more what sort of an aggregate is formed or is it in this way or they are oriented in opposite directions. Here we have shown that in this at this point we are not able to say it, that this N terminal and the C terminal they are all going parallel is that the way it is aggregating or it is any other way. So, now let us look at that if you look at this amino acid residues which are present in these uh, regions. Now, you plot here the, the electrostatic charges on these individual residues. The end terminal is, is has a particular charge and the C terminal has a red charge here these are positive negative charges as we can see. And if you lay this like this is a complementarity comes in here 
it is because of this, this association is happening. The electrostatic interactions here, positive negative charges are coming close and that is what is causing the aggregation, okay. See this aggregation, which means these two chains are not going in the same direction, but they are going in the opposite direction and that is what is shown here. See the aspartate is a, is a negatively charged residues, glutamate is a negatively charged residues. What is present here? N terminal this is the lysine which is the positively charged residues. The positively charged residues is coming close to the negatively charged residues and all of this in a, therefore this is the complementarity of the charges which are there. Same thing is happening here okay the N terminal lysine 68 you put them in opposite orientations this portion is this and this portion is this put them in opposite orientations this leads to the mechanism of, of the association process and that is what is shown here. So, you draw adjacent chains in the opposite directions N terminal to the C terminal, N terminal to the C terminal and N terminal to the C terminal things like that. Notice the extension present at the C terminal is quite small compared to the extension present at the N terminal. So, therefore, you see this here and then you further go down and then see further helix is formed. This is one particular helix. Now, you form another helix at your next, next step. So, once again you see these helices once again you will have to put them in opposite directions N terminal to the C terminal the entire C terminal is covered here entire C terminal has formed a helical structure this is a stepwise process as I shown you earlier and this also is a helix structure and a large um, N terminal segment is flexible okay. So, you draw that here so the N terminal small helix a long helix the C terminal once again from here put in the opposite direction N terminal short helix and the long helix and these are complementary to each other and therefore they will form an association uh, associated state. Now we draw that picture in a in, a, in this manner to show the association which is happening. You lay them one over the other see there is nothing almost at the C terminal. C terminal is completely in the helical form the N terminal is hanging. So when you do this you get a cylinder you lay them one above the other you get a sort of a cylinder which means it is like a rope. See now the GED is now forming a rope and you have this flexible end terminals on either side. So these are like the arms, these are like the arms of this assembly of the helical associate. How is it useful? This is useful because this GED oligomer which forms a rope which binds to the membrane right means at the budding vesicle, budding vesicle at the neck of this this is all lipid membranes. Therefore, and the lipid membranes they have the negative charges and we have here uh, residues which have positive charges and they will bind to the phosphate groups of the negative charges of the lipid membranes. Therefore, this will associate in the as a form of a neck and uh, uh, wrap around the neck of the vesicle. Uh, so, that is how this entire rope is able to bind at the at the neck in a in the, in the tight manner. Now, from this of course, we can incorporate this in the and can taking the entire entire uh, dynamin and then you will have the organization of different domains in the dynamin assembly and the red ones are the GEDs and this is the assembly and all other domains you can put them aside and then you can see so you can form a rope with this kind of a thing various domains which are putting and this comes from the certain other biochemical evidences as well which domains are interacting this comes also from certain other biochemical evidences put that together here and say you generate a model of the organization of dynamin in this uh, form of a row and that is what is shown here. So, this is the neck of the envisionating vesicle this is the membrane this is the membrane surface here okay and you draw this like this the previous model which I showed you here you have the GT phase domain, middle domain, pH domain, GED and, and this here this is the GED in all of this this is alpha associating into this okay D is the GED okay A is GT phase domain and C is the pH domain these are from the two different molecules right opposite sides. Therefore, this will wrap around this vesicle here this is the dynamic tube. Therefore, we say this is the kind of a dynamic tube which wraps around the vesicle of the, the neck of the envisionating vesicle. That is how the process of endocytosis comes. Of course, for the biological process to happen for the um, separation of this thing uh, the GTPase energy is required GTPase hydrolysis works there to generate the separate out the, um, the budding vesicle. Okay. 
So that is how you study um, uh, association process. Now we will show you one example how the dynamics and the structure are important for the biological function. I already showed you in the case of HIV protease, I will show you one more example here and this is with regard to this particular protein called the dynein light chain protein. So this is a trafficking protein, it carries cargo from one side of the one part of the cell to the other side of the cell, it walks on the microtubule here, this is the cargo molecule and this is the small uh, dynein light chain. The particular portion of this protein here is actually binding to the cargo and carries it along on the uh, microtubule. And the structure of this one is shown a little bit in more detail here. So there is this small molecule here DLC8, this is approximately about 80-90 residues here. Okay. The structure of this protein is, is shown here, this is this fellow which actually binds to the cargo. In the dimer form, this actually remains as a dimer at pH 7 as pH 3 it is monomer, of course pH 3 it is not functional because at biological pH it is a dimer and it is the dimer which is responsible for binding to the cargo here and that is how it carries it forward and the monomer is not able to bind. What does that mean? If we change the pH of course you cause a transition in the structure of the molecule and it can affect your efficacy of binding the cargo and this is biologically important. I will show you this, illustrate this to you uh, how NMR was helpful in understanding this. This was actually studied using a particular cargo here with a small peptide here, somebody has this peptide here as a cargo and you have a dimer here. So this is the dimer, what does the protein consist of? It consists of helices here, there is a helix, helix and then of course you have a, a beta structure there, okay. So largely it is helical protein and you have the loops and the beta sheets going on. So at this point there are the beta structures and the, this is the dimer interface, this, uh, this is the beta 3, beta 4 loop. At the dimer interface the cargo is, is bound, so it is held together, the cargo is held together at the dimer interface by this kind of interactions there. Okay. <coughs> Therefore any perturbation that happens at the dimer interface will affect the binding, binding efficacy. Any perturbation that happens in the dynamics of the dimer it will also affect the binding efficacy. Okay. So let us see what happens. Now we look at the dynamics of this protein, this can be studied by relaxation data by the T1, T2, NOE and all of those ones which uh, will be covered also separately in uh, Professor Roshitosh lectures. And <coughs> so here you see the red ones are the areas where there is a dynamism. Okay. This is at one particular pH, this is at another pH, this is at pH uh, 7, this is at pH 6, so at slightly lower pH 6 or 6.5. So there is, there is a change in the dynamics in the protein as we change the pH of the solution okay? and this has important implications, this is what we will see. So pH 7, this is the uh, DLC at dimer and this is a very beautiful spectrum as you can see all the peaks are very well resolved. Okay? And you want to focus our attention on this particular, all these few peaks. I am showing only the few peaks, but things can happen at every other place as well. Just to illustrate, uh, now this is a particular um, four peaks, you look at it, this is G and this is serine and this is aspartate and this is isoleucine. So this at pH 7, this is a very well resolved spectrum. Now if you add the peptide, which is a cargo, add the peptide to the cargo, what happens? There is a kind of a peak movement because the peptide is binding. When the peptide is binding, of course, there is a structural change, and the chemical shift changes are happening. So it is coming, this peak has moved here, this peak has moved here, okay. And similarly, this peak has moved here, this peak has moved here. I am only showing you the four peaks. There are changes in other places as well. But just to illustrate these peaks, four peaks are picked up. Now, you do the same experiment at pH 6, you change the pH of the solution, you bring down to the pH, okay. at pH 6 what happens? See some of these intensities come back here, okay. some intensity has come back here and some intensity has come back here too. What is the meaning? It means that the binding efficacy of the peptide has reduced. So certain amount of free protein is produced, earlier everything was bound, the peptide was bound and once you change the pH, the binding efficacy has reduced, therefore this peak has come back here. Okay. So this has an important implication for the biological function as to how this protein can 
car carry the cargo. So this is the pH switch for cargo trafficking. If we change the pH slightly, then the binding efficacies will change. So why is it important? Because cargo trafficking meaning what? So the protein has to bind the cargo at some place and release it another place. Okay? What could be the mechanism for that? And we are saying here that if it has to be released, is a small change in the pH can do this. But how can the pH change happen? pH change can happen due to some signaling. The signals can come from outside to the system as a result of which there can be uh, change in the dynamics and this is the areas where there is dynamics changes. This happens because of the change in the dynamics. When there is a change in the dynamics of course the binding efficacy will change. Why does the binding efficacy change when you change the pH? Because of the protein becomes more dynamic. So when it is so then it is not able to bind it to in the same way as it was doing when it was at pH 7. Okay. So therefore here the dynamics and the structure are important for bringing out a biological function. The, therefore we say this is the pH switch for cargo trafficking. There can be other signals also, various other signals are also possible that okay, some other interactor will come and then call release and things like that. But even without that, even this small change with respect to the pH, there can be um, acidity and things like that, various sort of things can happen. And that can cause a change in the condition from one part of the cell to other part of the cell and then you will have the trafficking possible. Okay. So I think I have come to a close here. So with all of this, so we complete this particular portion of applications of NMR to different aspects of biological um, function. We can um, describe the various um, aspects of uh, structure determination. We described the protein folding pathways and we described the methods earlier and from the protein folding pathways we looked at the association with the large assemblies and the large assemblies how to investigate using different techniques and the different techniques are of course to be used carefully at a particular magnetic fields not to lose the intensities and then the association process can be investigated by using the special pulse sequences which we described. These were the um, three dimensional HNN, HNCN based experiments there are quite a va variations of those which will uh, which are quite useful in uh, addressing different kinds of protein systems. Okay. And then we also looked at how one can use this to study the folding pathways. We took two examples, one we, we took out the um, uh, sumo protein, then we looked at the HIV protease and demonstrated that cooperativity is an important phenomena and which can be understood using NMR. How cooperativity happens, this is the process which happens in the protein folding uh, process and this can be analyzed and understood which portions are cooperating in bringing about the final native state. And then we looked at the, how biological structure, protein structure and dynamics is responsible for the biological function. I think with that we will stop and we sort of uh, end the course here. <laughs>